Welcome to the History Den YouTube channel. This is the seventh video in the Ancient Greek series. Now, in the previous video, we dealt with the great power of ancient Greece, Sparta. In this video, we come to one of the great antagonists of Sparta, Athens. And despite sharing the same gods, the Athenians were fundamentally different from everything the Spartans stood for. In the broadest sense, you might say the Athenians pushed for freedom while the Spartans maintained a tightly controlled society. So back to Athens for a minute. Athens is one of the oldest cities in the world. Archaeological evidence points to the area being inhabited nearly 7,000 years ago, if you can imagine that. That is during the early Neolithic period. So th we're talking about the Stone Age. So this is just epochs ago. So during that time frame, the city went through several important phases, the most important of which was the Mycenaean Empire, at least from an early standpoint. After the collapse of the Mycenaeans around 1200 BC, Athens, like many Mediterranean cities, experienced a severe economic decline. Now, Athens derives its name from the Greek goddess Athena. It was in Athens that the first ideas of democracy would be formed in the 6th century BC. But we will get to all of that later. Okay, let's take a look at Athens topography. Athens is located in Attica in southern Greece, which you can see on this map to the right. In the top right map, you can get an idea of how large Attica is in comparison to the rest of Greece. You will also notice that it overlooks the Aegean Sea and is very prominently situated in that regard. So it's easy to see how Athens became the great naval power during ancient times. Now if you look at that map again on the left, you'll see where Athens is in regards to Thebes and Megara. Megara sits in the Isthmus on the way to the Peloponnesus, and it was this stretch of land, which was the Isthmus, that connected the Peloponnesus to Attica, and it was always the same route that Spartans will march when they attack Athens. Now, Attica is roughly about 1,000 square miles, so the city is Athens and the region is Attica, and the citizens, of course, are called Athenians. It's important to note that eventually Athens unifies the entire region and all the people living in Attica are considered, for the most part, Athenians. Now, Attica was not necessarily considered the breadbasket of ancient Greece. There were a few areas that produced some produce, but for the most part, like the rest of Greece, it's very mountainous. The advantage is the location of the city itself in terms of its relation to the sea. And Attica did provide a great port in the harbor of Piraeus. And that leads us to the next slide and the Athenian economy. Let's talk about Piraeus some more here. If you take a look at the map on the right, you can see where the port was located in terms of its relation to Athens. And you can see just how close they were. So this was the vital lifeline of Athens. If they lost this port, they could be permanently cut off from their all-important sea trade. Now right here, there were a series of walls that the Athenians could close off in case of a seaborne invasion. And they also had a series of walls on land that connected Piraeus to Athens itself. So it was very very protected and very hard for an invading army to lay siege to. Because of these walls, they could actually stay alive indefinitely with their massive sea trade economy that was going on. So Athens had a great deal of protection during times of war. And the port provided a huge amount of trade and wealth to the Athenian treasury. So if you remember in the last video, we talked about Sparta being way inland between those inhospitable mountains and was much farther away from its port than Athens. So all this is why the Spartans looked to land warfare and why the Athenians eventually looked towards the sea and become the prime Greek naval state. So in terms of the Athenian economy, a huge source of income for Athens were numerous silver deposits that were present in southern Attica. This gave Athens a huge amount of cash that enabled the Athenians eventually to build the largest navy in the eastern Mediterranean and allowed them to work on expensive building projects. They also used it to make coins, and you can see a picture of one such coin that was actually from ancient Athens. And of course, it's made out of, you guessed it, silver. Another big source of money for Athens was pottery. The surrounding hills of Attica provided a huge amount of red clay to Athens, which was crucial, of course, in making gray pottery. This contributed to even more wealth and increased trade as Athenian pottery was in demand all across the Mediterranean. Now, if you remember the last video, I mentioned that Spartans gave up pottery basically for their military, but the Athenians embrace it and will export it all throughout the classical period. 
the Athenians were also able to cultivate grapes and olives, and those would become the dominant staples in their agricultural economy. But they also, like many other Greek city-states, grew grain. And there were some places, actually, that afforded that, that had excellent soil to accomplish that task. Now, before we get to Athenian history in terms of the development of their polis and the government structure they had, I want to talk about the three distinct phases in the history of the polis or I probably should say the progression of the polis. The first was there was a ruling aristocracy that controlled everything. All the top appointments, all the top government positions, and they also controlled the economy. The second was the tyranny, and this involved the rule of one man. Now this has a bad reputation today, but in those days it was not necessarily a bad guy. It was much more complicated than that. And many of the people looked to this ruler as a counter against the rule of the aristocracy. And the final place, of course, is the birth of democracy in Athens. So we will cover all three of these phases right now. Alrighty then, let's move on. If you remember in the last video, we talked about the Spartans being Dorians, as it was the Dorians who had invaded the Peloponnesus before Sparta was even formed. Now, Attica was able to escape the Dorian invasion and remain their own people throughout the Dark Ages and thereafter following the Bronze Age collapse. So the Athenians were proud of the fact they could trace their roots back to Homeric times and the Bronze Age without any interruptions like the Dorian attacks in the Peloponnesus. So as a result of all of this, there is this linguistic and cultural divide between the people of Attica and the people in the southern Peloponnesus. You can see that Attica, which is in pink, is relatively untouched from the Dorian regions of ancient Greece. You will also notice that in that map to the north of Attica is Boeotia. They were sometimes allies and sometimes rivals of Athens and Attica. The Boeotians also remained free of the Dorians, but not from internal strife, which was mainly caused by the warmongering of Thebes. Thebes is the dominant city in Boeotia, as Athens is the dominant city in Attica. Now, kind of like Sparta, we know little about the early history of Athens. And we also know little how Athens became the dominant player in Attica. But it seems early on it was certainly more peaceful than all the internal strife that was going on in the Peloponnesus because of the Dorian attacks. So there are no real major wars that are going on in Attica that we see in the Peloponnesus between the Helots and the Spartans. Thus, it's fair to assume that the region was generally peaceful as compared to the rest of Greece during that time period, at least. I should point out that most of the people living in Athens and Attica were Ionians. And as you can see on that map, most of the Ionian Greeks are living in Asia Minor. So Athens and the Greek people in Ionia shared this cultural heritage. Okay, so let's move along here. Athens, as described by Aristotle, was first ruled by aristocrats in the 8th century, where the family you were born into played an important role whether you were politically successful. But keep in mind this is a bunch of aristocrats, not a few. So this is very different than Sparta, which just had a few people running the show, what we term an oligarchy. But as I said before, it's about the birthrights. So if you were going to make it in Athens in those early days, your father had better be somebody or you were out of luck. Now there were four ruling tribes in Athens. That is four original tribes. Think of these as large families. And if you were lucky enough to be born into one of these tribes, you were in good shape for the rest of your life. These tribes were also used to organize the military, kind of similar to what we see in ancient Rome. Each tribe had their own regiment that was part of the overall Athenian military. The tribes also performed religious functions, and that is also very similar to the Roman tribe. Now back to the aristocrats for a moment. They not only controlled the farms and government, but they also were the law. So if you had any dispute in those days, you had to go to a noble, and he would decide the case. Because there were no judges, there weren't even written laws. The nobles were the law, and they knew it, and they interpreted it. There was an early class system in Athens in which one class dominates, similar to the patricians in Rome. The dominant Athenian class was called the Eupatrids, and that literally translates to offspring of the noble fathers. So you can see again how birthright was very important in Athenian society. The Eupatrids formed the Athenian nobility, so they dominated the Athenian government 
and the farms. So what does all this mean? Well, as you can see in the early days, there was no democracy in Athens. And so most of the citizens of Athens were actually working for these nobles in a form of serfdom. Yes, they were in fact citizens, but many of them were indentured servants. Now, as we enter the seventh century, Athens begins to fundamentally change as commerce begins to increase. What I mean by commerce is something other than just farming. Athens, as in other Greek city-states, begins to experience new forms of revenue, new trade, which produces new forms of wealth. As a result, we see new class distinctions form. And more importantly, aristocrats are less determined by birth and more by money. So there's kind of this movement away from birth to money. Now, birth is still the most important thing, but more people are making their mark on wealth. So there is more of a chance to get ahead than before. In other words, in the old system, there was just an upper and a lower class, the have and the have-nots based off of birthrights. But a new class emerges called the Zugatai. The Zugatai are sort of a middle class. They were well-off farmers. These were probably the first hoplites. This new class of independent farmers is very different than the previous ruling traditional aristocratic class. So there are huge changes occurring in Athens. Going forward, we are going to see the hoplites have an increasing role in Athenian politics. But something else is occurring around Greece at this time, too. We're starting to see the first emergence of tyrants. And initially, Athens resists this political change, but eventually it makes its way to the city. And the tyrants, along with the hoplites, are beginning to exert more pressure on the ruling aristocratic class. So, as we move into the late 7th century, we find the aristocratic rule in Athens being challenged. There's a huge amount of discontent and unrest among the citizens. And basically what they want is change from the traditional aristocratic rule. As a result, one of these tyrants attempts to establish a tyranny in Athens. His name is Chilon, but it fails in 623 BC. This leads to the Code of Draco, or Draco's Laws. He replaced the prevailing system of oral laws and blood feuds and created a written code that could be enforced only by a court. Now, it's been known for its harshness, but that's kind of unfair, because all he was doing was writing down the existing laws that were already out there. But this was one of the first times laws had been written down. So this is of huge importance, because the average citizen now who could read could go ahead and examine the laws for himself, and then even tell other people about the law. So if you remember a few slides ago, we talked about the aristocracy having that power of enforcing and interpreting the law. Well, now some of that power is being taken away because it's been written down. So we really see the oral law going away. And people can read, can learn the law themselves, like I just said. Now, one of the real positives of Draco's law was that it eliminated blood feuds, which were becoming a real problem. That is taking revenge in your own hands rather than relying on written laws. So as we move into the early 6th century, Athens' problems still did not go away even though they had written down many of their laws. The main problem was still slavery. And as I said before, these were citizens. Citizens who became slaves as a result of debt. So by this point in Athenian history, there are so many slaves that it's become a serious problem for Athenian society. Now these citizens are so far into debt they can never really pay off the aristocrat they owe the money to. So they are forced to work the farms for good. So there's a lot of pressure to fix this problem. And other cities around Greece are having the same problem. And this is where the tyrannies are installed to eliminate the slavery problem. So it was these revolutions that pushed the Athenians into reform. And they decided to hand the reins over to one archon. The natural leader chosen was Solon, because he was a successful military general. He was also extremely well respected. Solon was not really seen as a noble, but somewhere in the middle, so he had a lot of popularity. Also, his policies were seen as moderate, so this was a positive too. The single most important reform Solon made was that he canceled the debt that included anything to do with slavery. So this was very popular with the lower classes. But, and here is the important point, he only eliminated the debts that were associated with slavery. Any other type of debt was left intact. So he sort of takes the middle ground here, and that's what he's got to do. He's got to appease the lower classes, but he also can't afford to insult the aristocratic rulers. So he sort of throws a bone to both sides. 
Now, even though Solon fixed the problem with debts and slavery, he had to fix things going forward as well. Otherwise, new problems would occur. So one thing he did was change the immigration policy of Athens. And what he did was he offered citizenship to anybody who came to Athens to settle. That is, you didn't have to necessarily be born in Athens to become a citizen. This had the effect of bringing people in with trade skills. But perhaps the most profound change Solon made was he changed the Athenian constitution. Now, before Solon, only aristocrats alone could serve in the government. In other words, as I said before, it mattered who you were born to. Now, wealth became the defining criteria, not just birth alone. So he kind of removed the power of birthrights from the ruling aristocrats. So we'll take a look at that constitution right now. Okay, so here is Solon's constitution. And as I said before, it was a four-class system. And again, not based off of birthrights, but money. And not just money, it's based how much you produce each year. So if you take a look at the top class, the Pentia Casio Medimnoi. Wow, I can't believe I just pronounced that, but that's it. They were the top class of citizens, as I said, and they had to produce 500 bushels of goods per year. The second class were the Hippe, and they had to produce 300 bushels. The Zugatai, the third-rated class, had to produce 200 bushels of goods per year to be a member of that class. And as I mentioned before, they made up the first hoplites. And the lowest class were the Thetes. They had to produce 199 bushels of goods per year. Now, as you can see in the bottom part of the slide, that is the government as it was set up by Solon. And there are four basic units to this government. The top layer are the archons and magistrates. Now, only the Pentia Casio Medimnoi in the Hippes could become archons and magistrates. That was only available to them. But Solon did make other bodies of government available to the other classes. So the Zugatai, even though they couldn't hold the top positions, they could join what was called the Council of 400. Now, we don't know a lot about what this council did, but we assume it had to have had some sort of power. The Ecclesia was the assembly, and the Thetes could join that. So they also had the ability to participate in the government. But maybe one of the most revolutionary changes that Solon made was the Heliaia. That was a court of appeals that was formed from all the citizens, and they could overturn any decision by a magistrate. So that was very important because it checked the power of the archons and magistrates. So there is almost a balance of power that's going on with Solon's constitution, something we see in the U.S. government. Now, Solon made all of these laws, but within one year, he takes off. He sort of gets out of Dodge, as the cliche goes. Now, what is going on with that? Well, there's no doubt that Solon realized that the old aristocrats would probably resent some of the laws he passed. So he probably wanted to get out of there and avoid all of the complaints. And so, predictably, that's exactly what happened. And there were three primary aristocratic families that wanted to make their own changes that were, of course, beneficial to them. So there were several of these factions fighting against each other, and with Solon not even around, it was difficult to solve all the unrest that was occurring. So let's go ahead and take a look at each one of these factions. The first group were called the Pedia or the Pediacoi. Now they were led by a man named Lycurgus, and do not get him confused with Lycurgus of Sparta. That was somebody completely different. These were the ones that grew most of the grain that was supplied to Athens, and that gave them tremendous leverage during times of food shortage. Now, these guys favored going back to the old ways of complete aristocratic domination. The second group was referred to as the Paralia, and this name referred to the population living along the southern tip of Attica by the coast. They were led by a guy named Megacles. Now, the Paralia were not as strong as the Pediacoi. And the primary reason for that is they didn't have the same ability to produce as much grain as the plainsmen. Now, they favored keeping Solon's moderate policies in place. Now, there is even a third group, as I mentioned, the Hooper Acrioi. I believe I pronounced that correct, the Hooper Acrioi. Now, these people were not really represented previously by any formal party, and they also dwelled primarily in the hills. So they were by far the poorest of the Athenian population, and they didn't even produce any grain. The only products that they made were honey and wool. Now, they were led by a guy named Pisistratus, and he organized them into a functioning party. Now, this party was grossly outnumbered by the Plain Party, or the Pediacoi, the first party I talked about. 
even if they combined up with the second party, they still could not outnumber the petty Akoi. So it's clear the petty Akoi, at least at this point, have the advantage. But it is Pisistratus who will become the key player over the next two decades. And I should also point out that Pisistratus favored the most radical changes to the Athenian constitution. He wanted to make all the laws beneficial to the poor. And so let's talk about him in the next slide. So Pisistratus becomes Athens' first tyrant. And he rules for about five years, but then he is tossed out by the other two factions who became jealous of his power. But Pisistratus doesn't go away. In fact, he returns to take advantage of a disagreement between Megacles and Lycurgus. And with Megacles' help, he drives out Lycurgus and his faction. So Pisistratus is once again restored to power as a tyrant. But the situation doesn't resolve itself, and Megacles and Pisistratus have their own falling out. And once again, Megacles joins the opposition and throws out Pisistratus. So there's all this back and forth going on. But Pisistratus is a very resilient man, and he again doesn't go away. He travels around the Mediterranean to collect money and arms from foreign cities. And this time, he's not going to make any deals with Megacles. He's going to take the city by force without any deals. He lands at Marathon and defeats all of his enemies and is yet again tyrant for a third time in Athens. After this, things really start to calm down, and Pisistratus is able to rule for another decade right up into the time of his death. Now, Pisistratus isn't actually a bad ruler. He turns out to be pretty moderate in terms of his policies. So here's the pros and cons to his rule. He's very popular with the people, and as I said before, he did not rule very harshly. He was very gentle in dealing with the Athenians. Interestingly, he also kept Solon's laws in place for the most part and allowed the bodies that Solon had created to function. He also also, for the first time, creates circuit courts so people had representation outside the city. Because if you can imagine in those days, it was hard to get around and travel to Athens if you were way out in the country. So this gave people, for the first time, their ability to have their voice heard in the courts if they had a dispute. There were some cons to Pisistratus. First is he disarmed the people, but that probably was to stop all of the unrest and upheavals that were going on. He also exiled many of his enemies particularly from the first two factions that we had discussed in the previous slide. And also, invariably, there was some cronyism going on big time. Many government bodies were run by his own people. He also instituted a very controversial tax system, which was the first in Athenian history. But he was also clever enough to play the good guy and relieve many people of their tax burdens. Okay, so let's move on here. So as we move into the late 6th century, Pisistratus finally dies in 527 B.C., and he leaves control to his two sons, Hippias and his brother Hipparchus. Now, they pretty much continue their father's policies of moderation, but there's trouble in paradise. And in 514 BC, Hipparchus is killed in a plot against the government. Hippias, however, survives, but he is not the same man after the plot. He becomes permanently paranoid and nervous of everyone around him, and there are mass persecutions. As a result, the opposition stiffens against Hippias, and they plead with the Spartans to come to Athens and force Hippias out. And that's exactly what happens in 510 BC. The Spartans under Cleomenes assist the powerful family, the Alcaminidae, and remove Hippias from power. So after this, there's factions once again competing for control in Athens, and we'll get into that in a moment. But before that, I want to talk about the legacy of the tyranny in Athens. It served to check the aristocratic power like it did in many other Greek cities. And in a strange way, it allowed Solon's laws to go forth, giving it some time for the Athenians to work out all the nuances before the transition to direct democracy. So it's kind of like a trial and error thing. So as we leave the period of tyranny in Athens and enter the early 5th century, there are two competing factions, each with their own agenda. One faction under Isagoras wants an oligarchy under the Spartan model and a return to aristocratic power. Another faction under Cleisthenes wants a direct democracy. Isagoras initially wins out and becomes Archon in 508 BC, but Cleisthenes doesn't give up and continues to push hard for a democracy and has the support of a lot of people around Athens. Meanwhile, the Spartans get nervous of Cleisthenes' emerging power, so they return and push Cleisthenes out into exile. 
But in one of the great moments in Athenian history, the people resist and push for Cleisthenes, and a revolution starts and serious unrest occurs. Eventually, Cleisthenes wins out and comes to power, and he puts Athens on a path towards the first democracy the world has ever seen. So after Cleisthenes takes power, he decides finally to put Athens on a democratic footing. And the way he does this is he creates ten new tribes from the original four. And these are ten new completely new tribes. And the goal of this was to reduce the factionalism of the traditional clans. Furthermore, he made sure that each tribe had total representation around Athens and Attica. So each tribe had three tridies assigned to them and their sole job was to represent the people in their district. There was one of these in Athens, one in Attica, and another one in the coast. So again, each tribe had representation everywhere in Attica. Cleisthenes broke it down even further into something called a deem, and these were at the very local level to take care of people perhaps in a single town. Each deem would keep roles on each citizen within their region. They also kind of function like a mayor and perform religious rites. So there is local representation at the grassroots for the average citizen. Cleisthenes also created a new Council of 500. And this was the huge change. It was a fully democratic council. For the first time, it was open to all adult male citizens. And at this assembly, everybody had the right to speak in front of the assembly. So these are the first freedoms of speech in history that we see. Also, the laws applied without class distinction. Now, even after all these democratic changes took place, the Athenians were still very worried about tyrants coming back. So they created something called ostracism. And that is one person could be exiled each year, no matter what the reason. And that was to keep any single person from gaining too much power. And this was done by election by all the citizens of Athens. Interestingly enough, an individual who was ostracized didn't actually lose their property, but they had to leave Attica for 10 years. But they could come back after that time. So it's not a complete banishment. So that pretty much wraps it up for the Athenians, and this leads us right up into the time of the Persian Wars. And that is what we will get into in the next video.